It is my pleasure. It is my pleasure to um, start with the land acknowledgement offered um, to you by a dear colleague from the dance community and someone who's worked with me in many capacities and many other ways. This is no other than Aria Evans. Aria is a queer Toronto-based award-winning interdisciplinary artist whose practice spans dance, creation, performance, and film. Aria draws on the experiences from Afro-Indigenous plus settler heritage to capture meaningful social and cultural themes through their interactive art. With a large scale vision, collaboration is the departure point to the work that Aria creates under their company, Political Movement. Advocating for inclusion and the representation of diversity, Aria uses their artistic practice to question the ways we can coexist together. Her website, www.politicalmovement.ca. And that is something we love at Sopamo is the idea of how do we coexist together? This is the reason why it's not called Convergence Festival, but Divergence. It's about the divergent voices and the ways in which those voices amplify space. Welcome, Aria. Miigwech, well, Alan, Kevin. Just give me one moment. Quay, hello. My name is Aria Phoenix Parsons Evans. I carry both my parents' last names as well as the spirit of song and rebirth. My father is Afro-Indigenous, Mi'kmaq from Woolville, Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq and Black. And my mother who raised me is British. I have come to understand my relationship to my mixed race indigeneity through the arts, a community where I have contemplated the idea of belonging while celebrating the many experiences of those around me who are indigenous. What I know to be true is that the experience of being indigenous is not monolithic and it looks many different ways. The oral history that has been shared with me tells that Takaranto was and is known as the gathering place for many indigenous nations and visitors. I think about what it means to gather, to come together, especially when thinking about this conference gathering divergence. I was recently working with Ange Loft, an interdisciplinary performing artist and initiator from Ganawagi, on a project that she is leading called Talking Treaties, where we were looking at the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. Known casually as the dish, it is a treaty originally between the Anishinaabe the Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Something that I found really interesting was that this agreement was put in place when people were taking more than they needed in a time of rapid trade. In the agreement, it talks about the dish with enough to go around, never being empty and one spoon to feed many. It also talks about not bringing any knives to the table. What can this dish represent today? I have been thinking about what it looks like to come together with our weapons put down, our literal weapons, as well as our figurative ones, in peace. Can we gather together with good intentions, good minds, and good hearts? Can we feel good things, say good things, see good things, hear good things, with the intention that we are all coming together from shared values of compassion and care? Can our collective action in this way make change? I share these sentiments with the week you have ahead of you, envisioning a space together through 
sectoral change, digital impact, financial well-being, anti-Black racism in the arts. To imagine what the reciprocity of this gathering place is going to be. Well, Laliak for sharing that dance with me. I would like to take a moment to collectively reflect. I invite you to close your eyes and be present with your thoughts. You can have your cameras on or off. And I'm gonna ask you some questions. Who are your ancestors? And how did they come to this land? What is your relationship to this land? In what ways does this land support you? How do you give back to the land? Together, in your own way, I invite you to send a message of gratitude to the land that is feeding us, watering us, growing us. It can be verbal, it can be in your mind, it can be a gesture. But together, let's put focus and think about the caretakers who have made where we live possible. In Takaranto, where I am, that is the Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee, the Wendat and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I think about what it means to be a caretaker from the past, but I also think about what it means to be a caretaker now in this moment and into the future and how we can play an active role in ensuring that the generations to come can be grown, can be fed and can be watered by this same land. And as we come back from our sentiment of gratitude, 
Let's imagine that we are making a circle together, that we are gathering together. If you wanna create a circle with your arms, you can. If you just wanna have the idea of creating a circle, that's perfect. And I invite you to move into today's session with these sentiments of having enough to go around with our weapons down. Thank you. I'll pass it back to you, Kevin. I would like to take this time to introduce the Executive Director of Cultural Pluralism of the Arts Movement Ontario, Charles Smith. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome everyone. It's been a great um, honor to work on this program over the next three days, and uh, my role here is to introduce our first keynote. Uh, we're really honored that um, Dean Dory Tunstall is with us today. Um, her bio will be put in the chat room, so I'm not gonna read all that, but a couple of key things that I think are important is that currently Dory is the Dean of the Faculty of Design at the Ontario College of Art and Design University, OCAD University as it's called. And she is the first black and black female Dean of a Faculty of Design anywhere in the world. I first like to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and Huron Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians upon the lands in which I live, as well as OCAD University's um, main campus. Um, as uh, so I'm, I'm gonna talk, uh, the talk is sort of divided into two parts. First, just talking about what it means to become and be a first black, uh, particularly a Dean in design and, and how my history in some ways of my career uh, gives an indication why diversity and inclusion is not enough. Um, and then the second part of my talk is gonna be sort of some of the things that we've done at OCAD University that has made in some ways, this process of decolonization combined with diversity and inclusion, just the, the right place for me to be. Um, so this is a story of, in some ways, the super token. <laughs> and just for a definition, uh, a super token is an individual for a marginalized groups whose talents are so desired by institutions that they're able to overcome the institutions, their innate aversion to the individual's identities in order to have access to those talents. Um, I am a super token and, and, and I'm gonna tell you uh, three stories about being a super token. One, how diversity has not been enough, how inclusion has not been enough and how decolonizing design, which is where I'm at at OCAD University is just right. Um, so they say diversity is getting invited to the party. Um, and again, as people of color, LGBTQ, Muslim working class folks, people with disabilities, we are supposed to be super happy to receive the invitation. Um, and again, I'm talented enough, like I was explaining, I'm a super token and old enough to be able to get lots of uh, invitations. So this is my <laughs> resume in terms of all the different institutions that I've been into. Uh, some of which, again, quite prestigious, if you care about that system of prestige. Um, but just to sort of say that, like, again, in many cases in these institutions that I've gone to, I've brought the diversity. Um, and this is just to sort of show. And in some places, I've been in extraordinarily diverse um, contexts. So this is not an, a, a photo from my anthropology class at Stanford University but it was really close to that kind of diversity in there that we had so many indigenous, in my cohort, so many indigenous um, uh, colleagues that we had to not just refer them as indigenous, but by their actual you know, communities and nations, Lenape uh, had to refer to them as um, uh, Ho-Chuk. Um, I, I met my first person who was Métis. Uh, we had so many diverse, um, groups that we considered ourselves the, um, the Congress of Oppressed because in our cohort, the only white woman was Jewish and the only white male was homosexual. 
And then everyone else was from all over the world, from different backgrounds and different agencies. And the thing that was really interesting is that we brought that diversity into our courses, into our classes. Um, again, it was really challenging to do so. We actually spent the first class um, with uh, Chicano professor Ren Renato Rizaldo, um, basically oppressing each other is the way to say it. When you bring all this diversity together, many of us who was always the only one in the situation that um, we were all trying to learn and present and speak um, in a voice for the first time. And our voices came out as European, white, Anglo-Saxon <laughs> um, men, because that was the language of the academy and that was the language of elite academy. And so this class of extraordinary diversity um, we halfway through, we were trying to figure out why we were not enjoying our education, why we were not enjoying being there. And it's because we weren't bringing ourselves. So being, a, again, diverse, smart group of kids, what we decided to do is to bring ourselves. So um, I and my colleague, Maria Corteras, uh, we started it by bringing in uh, music, like we brought in French hip hop and we talked about what it meant to the readings that we were assigned. And then the next week, someone brought in um, Vietnamese poetry. And then the next week, someone brought in food. And so we began to bring all of our cultures into the classroom. And that was my first experience of making education connected to who I was. Um, and what I learned later, that's the process of decolonization. But being even this amazing diverse uh, context was not enough because we brought that into our other classes, that diversity, that decolonization. And the best way to say it is that uh, members of the faculty freaked out <laughs> because they couldn't find themselves, white, male of a certain generation, represented in the interests of the students. They went to the provost another white male of a certain age and complained about it. And the, the institution decided to break the anthropology department into two groups. One that was focused on anthropological sciences that met the needs of these white men of a certain age, um, and then everyone else. <laughs> and then my cohort, student cohort, Akin, was incredibly diverse, but then some Ford Foundation money came in the year after that, and then the cohort became actually strongly Eastern European. So even in this context, getting invited, being in a diverse is not enough if, in some ways, um, it doesn't change the actual power structure of the institution or the firm, because those who were discomforted by that diversity we're still in the positions of power to be able to segregate diversity out um, um, so that they can maintain their space and maintain their practices. So diversity is not enough. Inclusion, inclusion is being getting asked to dance. So you're invited to the party, you get asked to dance. Again, my dance card has often been quite full. <laughs> Um, and, and it's been really interesting because it's been mostly white men who've been done the asking. And in some ways, this is a really good thing because it meant somehow they've been able to get beyond their sort of biases and assumptions to see this young cisgendered uh, female black person as in some ways the next generation of them, right? The next generation of them. Um, but again, it's not enough. So I was once, the best way to say, bullied out of uh, one of my high tech jobs, and I'm not going to tell you which one. And the reason why was, again, in the context of inclusion, we are working on a project that this is consulting. So it's a thing where you're doing 80 hours per week. Um, we had a big client deliverable. The executive came in and did what we call a swoop and poop, which is come in, spend five minutes telling you everything that is wrong, which is basically pooping all over the work that you've done, right? And so <laughs> maybe it wasn't enough sleep or I was listening too much to, um, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me, Aretha Franklin, but I sort of piped up and said, 
it's really disrespectful you to come in in five minutes you haven't even listened to all the work that we've done you're not understanding what it is that you've done like this this experience doesn't feel very good and uh the after effect of me standing up for respect uh was within a couple of days uh, my team members couldn't make eye contact with me. Uh, within a couple of weeks, there was all these meetings that are being held in which I wasn't invited to the meetings. Uh, that my, within two weeks, the plum assignments that had been put on my other projects to do began to be shifted and moved away. Um, and again, even in the conversation with my supervisor, Again, they being called into meetings about the problem of Dory without Dory being included in any of those conversations, right? So, so in this sense, what I've learned was inclusion is not enough because it's fine if I want to do the waltz or the foxtrot or the polka. Um, but the moment I want to break out into a salsa or the moment I want to break out into, I don't know, the, the running man or any other sort of thing, then I don't belong and I become a problem. So inclusion is not enough without real power change because there's a white European male, cis, hetero, middle class, able body and mind, Christian status quo that is the structure of the power. And so when you ask to dance, they're only asking you to do their dance, not your dances. And thus inclusion, again, is not enough unless you're changing power. And for me, what becomes really important is that this requirement to do the dance that is not my dance, right, is often experienced as genocide to our spirits, right? that coming in 8, 12, 12 hours a day and not being able to bring your full self into that context, it hurts. It hurts every day. And every day that you do it, you take away a little bit of yourself and who you are and what's important. So I got bullied out of that job. Um, now, I say decolonizing design in this way is giving the most vulnerable control over the street party. Um, and in this context, uh, we have to first explain a little bit what colonization is. And so again, colonization is rooted. So this is from P. Wolf, Settler Colonialism. Um, colonization is rooted in the elimination of indigenous peoples, politics, polit polities, and relations from and with the land. Um, so if anyone is talking to you about decolonization and they're not talking about indigenous people and their relationship to the land, then they're doing something else. It's not about decolonizing. Um, and Eve Tuck and W.K. Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor. They um, help expand that to understand what's the relationships that happen within the settler colonial state. And so there are actions about repatriating land and sovereignty to indigenous tribes and nations, but it is also tied to the abolitionary abolition of slavery in its contemporary forms. So this is the <laughs> uh, this is the pipeline from schools to prisons. Uh, it's the dismantling of the imperial metropole. So the moving of resources away from communities into a center. Um, so all of these are part of the process as well. And at OCAD, we have to own up to the fact that we've played a role in colonization. So OCAD got on the map because the group of seven painters, like here, frankly, um, Carmichael, were part of the faculty um, and part of the students of OCAD University. Um, but again, we had to hold ourselves accountable because a lot of the work that they produced, right, was part of the colonial project. Um, this is um, Franklin Carmichael's uh, posters for the Canadian National Railway, where it's basically Europeans come to come to Canada. Look, there's no native people there, or if they are there, they're just for show, um, and um, and make a better life here in Canada. So the most important takeaway, I think, in understanding my career is that if we want diversity and inclusion, we have to actually change the power structures in our firms and our institutions. So 
Diversity is not enough if you don't change the power structure. Inclusion is not enough if you don't change the power structure. But luckily, I'm in a place where I'm not the super token. <laughs> and OCAD's really trying to change the power structure. And I'll just briefly go through the six steps that we're taking to really, really try and do that. Step one, we're putting indigenous demands first. Um, this is just a, 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 a montage of different images from our indigenous cluster hire. Um, but it's coming out of our academic plan where the first principle of our academic plan is decolonization. And so this has meant many things. First of all, in, uh, having a conversation what decolonization means, creating space for indigenous sovereignty within the institution. So this is our first cluster hire where we brought in five new Indigenous faculty members in 2018. I'm actually in the middle of my last negotiations of our second Indigenous cluster hires where our intention is to bring in six more. And part of building this critical mass where there's been hirings in other programs as well of Indigenous faculty and movements into leadership in terms of Peter Morin as being a uh, advisor to the provost, um, Nadia McLaren being a sort of community engagement um, um, coordinator, that this is all about how we create space for indigenous sovereignty and, and many ways OCAD being a place where people will begin to learn what does it mean to live under indigenous ways, what it means to learn under indigenous ways of being and knowing. Um, we've had to own up to our institutional racism and white supremacy. So um, former President Sarah Diamond uh, co-led a task force with the, um, Camille Isaacs, one of our professors on underrepresentation. And this was a project um, to understand, to collect the data around the underrepresentation of racialized and indigenous employees and their, uh, of those who were at OCAD, what their experiences are, but also set us forward in terms of, again, being able to develop an action plan uh, to directly address this, including the use of the Ontario Human Rights Code to hire more diverse faculty, administrators, librarians, administrative staff, um, as well as faculty. Um, and we had to have conversations like so this is a poster from um, a, a series of panels that we held around whiteness without white supremacy understanding the extent to which again white supremacy culture a set of cultural values exists within the institution and what is it we need to do in order to address that and change that in the ways in which we think about our communities and the decisions that we make um, we established authentic relationships with BIPOC community. So clearly this is pre-COVID, but this is me going everywhere where Black people were and they wanted me to be. Um, and coming not just as an individual, but coming as a representation of OCAD University. So for those who are familiar with First Fridays, that for, for the first two years I went to every First Friday um, just to understand the community and the network um, again, being a resource to the community. So we've held Black Reach design workshops and now we do them digitally with community members to teach their, show their youth um, how to engage with design. Um, but again, building authentic relationships is about um, the way in which you engage with consultation as well as partnership with communities. And I, I would say my key performance indicator, I have two really good indicators that we've done a good job of is, is that a couple of years ago, I went to an event and I just popped my head up and someone said, OCAD is in the house, right? So it wasn't about Dory being in the house, but OCAD as an institution being in the house, which meant that we had made ourselves institutionally present. The other key performance indicator is that pre-COVID, there was a lot of demands by the Black community on the use of our facilities. And that made me really, really happy because it meant that they now saw um, OCAD University as part of, part of the community, part of who has an obligation to them in order to serve their needs. And that's the kind of relationships that you wanna build. 
Um, in our hiring, we've made our calls about BIPOC community interests, not just ours. Um, so this is from the Black Cluster hire that we did a year ago. And um, there's kind of three things that I think are really important about this as a call. First, the highlight on the lived experiences um, that to bring, we want to bring Black lived experiences into the um, community. Um, that we're interested in people who are actually working within the community within an intersectional way. And that we're not looking for an interaction designer or whatever, but we're looking for people. What we need are people who are interested in Black speculative futures, multi sensory storytelling as it relates to Black representations, Black hip hop, or other Black cultural aesthetics. So, in turning it around to sort of say, what are the things that are of interest to the Black community? that we need in our institution, um, like the, the best way to say it is that the, the post went viral. Um, and in the end for uh, five positions, we ended up getting almost like 120 different applications, which again was an important message to the institution who was worried about the fact that we didn't, there wasn't enough black people who would be able to fulfill the positions we're looking at is that if you call to people in a way that resonates with who they are and resonates with their lived experiences, then they will come. Um, but in order to create space for this, we had to, we had to redefine our criteria of evaluation. So again, we realized like we have a ver an, an ideal version of an employee, which actually requires that you have to have been fully embedded in post-secondary institutions. Now, if you are a community that have experienced a uh, uh, systemic exclusion for post-secondary institutions, then you, you, you never would make the qualifications, right? So we had to redefine our qualifications to understand that there is excellence that exists outside of academia um, that we want to bring into our institution. Uh, and it comes in different forms. There's some people who, again, were excluded from post-secondary for one reason or another, but they've really focused on their industry and their practice. So instead of having taught for two years in a post-secondary institution, they may have been giving presentations to adults or giving talks in different places, which again, serves the same purpose of translating information from one generation to another. Or they may be a community connector where they focused on community organizations, community organizing, and instead of publishing in uh, conference presentations and journal and book presentations, they may have community um, meetings and uh, do testimonials about the good work that they're doing, which again is about the dissemination of knowledge to a wider group. And the last thing that we're doing is hiring for critical mass. Um, so this is this is the, <laughs> from last year's uh, black uh, cluster hire doubled the number of full time black faculty at OCAD University, and this is almost everyone except for one uh, one person. And um, and again, what was beautiful about this photo and that was mentioned by the by all the participants in the meeting is that everyone felt that they could speak in their diverse accents. Everyone we could like the conversations that we were having, the ability to bring all of themselves into the institution is facilitated by the fact that they see themselves amplified in the institution of not being the only one, not being the super token, not being the token at all. And so when you build in structures of critical mass, then you give people the freedom to bring their full selves into an institution. So just to sort of say, we're, we're definitely working on um, uh, showing other people how to do this. So on June 9th, I'm starting a course on hiring for decolonization, diversity, and inclusion, um, and creative industries. It's going to be, it's a micro credential. I taught it in the fall, so that'll be my second time teaching it. Um, but the thing I want to leave you with is just, again, to what extent to the institutions that you're engaged with are ready to and willing to take the six steps, putting indigenous demands first, owning up to institutional racism and white supremacy, establishing authentic relationships to BIPOC communities, again, calling to people from their interests and not just your institutional inference, changing the standards of qualification to take into account systemic exclusion, and then again, creating a context for critical mass where everyone can bring their full selves in their full diversity 
um, into the institution and find themselves welcomed, belonging, and amplified um, in terms of the value that their lived experience brings to the transformation of the institution. So with that, um, thank you very much. And if we have time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was so wonderful and, and heartfelt. Um, you know, just personally um, want to thank you kindly for your generosity and your presentation um, and just absolutely, you know, speaking such wonderful truths um, that, you know, many of us experience. Um, so thank you so very much, Dean. That was greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, you know, um, just the, the, absolute um, thought that has gone through all the process. It's so exciting to see you in this role. And um, we, I'm sure that it's a collective congratulations. We're cheering for you and very, very excited. Um, Dean Elizabeth, thank you so very kindly for that.